Good afternoon, everyone. Come now, sit up straight. I'm afraid you're all in for a bit of a telling off from me today, followed naturally by detention. Some 15 years ago, I was part of a group of 20 teachers from a variety of schools across Britain visiting schools in India. At one school, the kids put together a day of competitions between their top kids and us British teachers. It was fun. At the end, the kids announced that they would sing their national anthem. They sang the five stanzas of the Indian national anthem with so much pride, it brought tears to our eyes. But when they finished, they turned and looked at us, the British teachers, and said, now it's your turn. It's your turn to sing your national anthem. We teachers looked at each other, panic stricken. We all knew they had us. As we stumbled towards the stage, we whispered to each other, do you know it? Can you sing it? As we worked our way hesitantly through God Save the Queen, a huge sense of relief engulfed us when we got to the end of the first verse. We hurriedly sat down, and the Indian kids said, wow, the British national anthem is so short. <laughs> Not one of us felt there was anything wrong with our lack of knowledge and pride in our country. In fact, we had no sense of our country at all. Who is responsible for this? I suspect all of the people in this room have a sense of what it means to be British that, teeps, that taps deep into your souls. So why are you so different to that group of teachers, and frankly, quite a number of teachers in our schools? Do you know? Do you have any idea how many schools sing God Save the King? Because from where I'm standing, it doesn't seem like anyone cares. I've been shouting for decades about the importance of schools in the fight over values and culture. Culture is everything. And schools and families are responsible for framing and nurturing the general culture in our society. Politicians, like those at this conference, do what they can, but we cannot expect politicians to do everything for us. You are meant to be the movers and the shakers. You are meant to be the thinkers and the writers. And yet, hardly any of the articles, podcasts, exposés, or even chit-chat dinner conversation is ever about schools. I listen to all of you wondering why the young are not conservative. Rarely is anyone interested in truly trying to understand how our schools are shaping our society. Can I be frank? I expect more of you. Some of the commentators are brilliant and so very brave, as we have seen today and will see throughout this conference. And people like James Orr and his team who have organized this conference are simply extraordinary. But again, we cannot just depend on them to fix things for us. All of you in this room ought to know how crucial mass education is to the future of our country. You ought to know how important it is for our schools to embrace small c conservative values like personal responsibility, having a duty towards others, self-sacrifice, adult authority, belonging to one's country, and rejection of victimhood. You'll never say this out loud, but you all don't think much of us teachers. So you take your children out of the state sector and put them in private schools and assume you've dealt with the problem. But what you don't get is that the private schools are just like the state schools in terms of culture. In fact, in many ways, they're worse. If you don't like the woke agenda, then you had better avoid private schools like the plague. As sure as night follows day, the more privileged the space, the more woke it is. Of course, there are exceptions. Not all schools, state or private, are peddling extreme leftist views, for now. Our school, Michaela, is one of those exceptions. But any school that is exceptional on this front is having to actively fight the leftist culture that is engulfing both our schools and our communities. Remember O'Sullivan's Law. John O'Sullivan was a speechwriter for Margaret Thatcher. And he explained that any organization that isn't explicitly fighting left-wing views will eventually become more and more left-wing. 
So over decades, our schools and indeed many of our institutions have abandoned their small c conservatism. You all are meant to give schools the political backing, the media support, and the normality of expectations in our society that should mean we teachers don't have to overthrow the country's overarching general culture in order to succeed. Teachers who you criticize for being woke are simply promoting the culture that surrounds them. What you don't understand is that in 2023, these teachers are normal. You are the ones who are weird with your small c conservative values. Teachers at Michaela actually lose friends because they choose to teach at Michaela. My teachers have to stay silent at Christmas dinner with their families. Often my young teachers complain to me about not being able to find a boyfriend or a girlfriend because young people in their 20s are leftist identitarians and my teachers' views are deemed unacceptable by our cultural gatekeepers. Small c conservatism is for the old, the boring and the irrelevant. Elon Musk appeared on Bill Maher recently and Maher asked him what caused this woke mind virus. Elon Musk, amazingly, said something that other commentators never say. I think it's been a long time brewing, he said. The amount of indoctrination that's happening in schools and university is far beyond what parents realize. I only came to realize this somewhat late. The experience we had at school and college is not the experience that kids today are having and hasn't been for 10 or 20 years. So first prize goes to Elon Musk, because he actually mentioned schools. Mark my words, if we don't get on top of the culture that schools are promulgating, we will lose our country. You want to know why the universities do such a good job of pushing critical race theory? Because the schools have done such a good job of ensuring young people are ripe for the picking. If you want to know why young adults say things you find baffling, you must look to our schools for the answer. The question we should be asking is why Michaela teachers think differently. For one, they're open-minded. Having experienced firsthand kids being rude and dismissive of their teachers, they come to Michaela questioning the explanations for school failure, which tend to point entirely to poverty and lack of funds. That isn't to say that poverty and lack of funds aren't problems, but my teachers come to see how complex the issues are. They come to see how adult authority has disappeared from our classrooms, how the desks are in groups, allowing the children to lead the learning instead of the teacher, how kids make demands rooted in their crushing and all-consuming belief in their victimhood, and how the children are indulged instead of being held to account. They see how learning could be so much better, especially for the disadvantaged, but that ultimately people value feeling compassionate over actually doing what is necessary to better enable disadvantaged kids to succeed. Our school, Michaela, is a wonderful example of what can be achieved when conservative values permeate a school's culture, where the adults, not the children, lead. But if children are leading the culture in many of our schools, is it any wonder that wokeism is so embedded? Are we all clear on what wokeism is? It is leftist identitarianism, where the left has abandoned the historical Marxist power dynamic which argues against the rich exploiting the poor, and instead they've adopted a hierarchy of power oppression which is viewed through identity. That's why being black or gay or disabled, to name a few, becomes one's identity, i.e. it becomes in the main who you are and the group to which you belong. This identity then grants you admiration or indeed derision, depending on whether your identity classifies you as oppressed or privileged. Talking of identity, I'll tell you something interesting. Right now, I'm in a room filled in the main with white middle class people. Yet not one of you, or your friends, sends your child to my school. Now don't get me wrong, I'm quite pleased that we have more spaces for kids from the inner city whose lives I want to transform for the better. 
But isn't it interesting how the white middle classes attend these conferences and go to dinner parties and talk about their love of small c conservative values, and yet, when given the choice, they send their children to private schools that have none of these conservative values and often the worst of woke culture. <laughs> Douglas Murray told me that his advice to his friends with children in private schools in the US, where leftist identitarianism is off the charts, was to simply take their children out of these schools Remove the fees, and these schools will soon change. Douglas finally came to the conclusion that the reason his friends weren't heeding his advice was because while they didn't like what their children were being taught, they would put up with it in exchange for the prestige of the school. Andrew Gutman, a white American father who bravely removed his daughter from Brearley, a top, expensive private girls' school in New York, because he was horrified at their stance on racial issues, traveled the whole of the US looking for an alternative school for his daughter and could not find a single secular school with values that would match with both his and ours. He tried to get the other parents at Brearley to take an interest in the fight. But while they agreed with Andrew's objections to the teaching of critical race theory, amongst other woke ideas, all that mattered to them was the status of getting their kids to Harvard, Princeton, or Yale. Eventually, Andrew came to the UK, looking at boarding schools for his daughter. While the UK schools are generally better than schools in the US, which isn't saying much, Andrew Gutman struggled to find a school which held the values that we all naively believe still exist wholescale in our school system. He found that the more prestigious the school, the closer it is to London, the more woke it is. I'm here to tell you that in the world of education, hardly anyone thinks like you. No doubt you know this to be true. That's why you ignore schools and hang out at conferences like these. <laughs> a few years ago, one of my new teachers came to see me, worried about the fact that we sing God Save the Queen as it was then. She was of Irish descent, and she said to me, exasperated, but Catherine, you don't understand. Do you know what they did to my people? And I responded, do you know what they did to my people? <laughs> Of all of the values that we try to instill in our children, I would say the one that visitors struggle with most is the idea of national identity. Belief in one's country, especially if that country is Britain, is wrong. I remember the journalist Dominic Lawson, who is hardly a man of the left, upon visiting our school and hearing all these brown and black children reciting the poem If by Rudyard Kipling, impressed and somewhat surprised, he turned to me and whispered, are you trying to be intentionally controversial, Catherine? <laughs> I was baffled. If is a beautiful poem that so embodies our values and is by a British author who carries a lot of cultural capital, i.e., it would be a shame to live one's life never having heard of Kipling. I wasn't trying to ruffle feathers. I was inculcating our small c conservative values into our school culture via a lovely English poem. At Michaela, we adults lead the learning, not the children. We instill a sense of pride in our country. I explain to new staff that when Colombia is playing in the World Cup and you go into a bar in Colombia to watch the match, there is no need to ask people which team they support. It's obvious they support Colombia. In England, however, you don't dare make that assumption. In fact, the idea that people should or would support England is bizarre, especially in areas with large numbers of ethnic minorities or immigrants. At Michaela, when the World Cup or the Euros are on, we put St. George's flags up around the dining hall. But even I cringed when many months later I was watching the ITV documentary about our school and I saw the flags in our dining hall in one of the shots and I, that had been filmed when the World Cup was on and my panicked thinking went like this. Bloody hell, what will people think of us? What was our crime? Hanging English flags up on the wall. That documentary can be found on the producer's website 
at strictestheadmistress.com, and it's worth watching. There are 12 rules on what children need to lead a successful life. And while I'm here, I need to say that anyone interested in working at Michaela, now or in the future, you can get onto our website and leave us your details. We can train you up to be a teacher. You know, I say that here because I know I might find some fellow conservative teachers. With us, you'll learn that children need to belong to their family, to their school, and to their country. Children need to be held to high standards, surrounded by adults who love them enough to discipline them when needed. Let me explain the pro thinking process of those who disagree with this. Their thinking goes like this. Who am I to tell a child what to do? We teachers and parents don't need to be in charge. Children are just as important as adults. To hell with adult authority. This thinking has been going on for decades. Whitney Houston, back in 1986, explained to us in her song, The Greatest Love of All, that children are the future, which she was right about. But then she says, we should let them, the children, lead the way. It is an inspirational song about never walking in anyone's shadow, living as you believe, but it never mentions duty or sacrifice. The celebration of me in 1986 was the precursor to the me, me, me culture of 2023. We have been frogs in hot water for decades, and now we are at boiling point. What's me, me, me culture, you say? Well, do you know that some kids identify as furries? Elon Musk is correct. You all have no idea just how bad things are in schools, and you ignore the vital and crucial role schools play in shaping our society's culture. There are kids right now in some schools with tails and ears pinned to their heads and bottoms. This isn't fancy dress. They identify as cats, you see. Kids aren't allowed to wear trainers to school, but they are allowed to wear ears and tails because that's their chosen identity. That's how they feel they belong. Meanwhile, over at my school, Michaela, my assembly to the kids a couple of weeks ago was about one of our year 13s who has been with us since year seven. Her mom, who raised her on her own, works as a cashier in a discount store. In October, this girl will go to Cambridge to study classics. When she was 14, <laughs> when she was 14, she wrote a little essay on stress. And in it she says, stress is an illusion. In the Rudyard Kipling poem, If, he states, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you. She goes on to explain that at Michaela, we trust in our ability to control our emotions and actions. People elsewhere allow their behavior to be controlled by the outside world because they see themselves as victims. Hurrah for her. Hurrah for all her Michaela teachers who instilled in her and in all of our pupils courage, resilience, hard work, and determination. So why do I need to throw all of you into detention? because you haven't been paying enough attention to the fact that our nation's culture is not only created in our schools, but that it is our children who are leading the development of that culture in our schools. Adult authority is long gone. So here I am, ringing the alarm. In 20 years, many of us will be retired or sadly dead. And the children in our schools will be in important and influential positions in our institutions. As G.K. Chesterton said, the true soldier fights not because he hates what is in front of him, but because he loves what is behind him. Well, I'm asking, how much do you love your country? How much do you love the values that you claim to defend? Do you love them enough to tweet under your own name? Do you love them enough to change your child's school to one that's less woke and ignore the impact on your social status? Do you love them enough to do more than simply chat to your friends who already agree with you at dinner parties? For heaven's sake, man, stand up and be counted. As Russell Crowe says in the film Gladiator, a clip I regularly play for my staff, hold the line, stay with me. What we do in life echoes in eternity. Will your life echo hollow? with cowardly hypocrisy, or will it echo with courage, valiance, and honor? The choice is yours. Strength and honor be with you all. Now get yourselves to detention.